Okay, welcome everybody. So, the goal of my uh, lecture series is to give a very whirlwind introduction to the subject of number field counting and class group distributions with the particular aim that there are many, many connections of these fields to computational number theory. Both a lot of these questions have been inspired by computational number theory. Progress in um, in these areas maybe can be applied uh, to computational number theory and computational number theory can can provide us a lot of evidence for for various conjectures and uh, new conjectures as well so that's that's the goal uh, there are um, notes uh, for these lectures that are available on the Park City webpage or you can also find them um, on my web page. This is my web page and if you go down to conferences you can see here the notes uh, for my course and it'll just open up a web page if you don't have a Dropbox app and you can get the PDF of them there. Um, and the notes have many more details uh, um, and a lot more references than I'll give in the talks and so you can can refer to those for a lot of the things I'll, I'll quickly brush over in the talks. There are also lots of exercises um, of a wide range of difficulty so if you look at some of them and you think oh that's trivial if you're you know been doing this a lot that's okay you can you can move on and then, but some of them really I, I even named exercise slash project because they're more of an in-depth investigation so they really range from very simple exercises to, to things that are really more projects than exercises um, so I hope you enjoy those the notes probably have a lot of typos uh, we've caught some of them but I'm happy uh, to hear any more uh, corrections, typos, questions about the notes, um, please just let me know or email me. All right. So let me get started with my uh, with my talk. So today I'm going to talk about number field counting. So number fields are finite extensions of the rational numbers. So these are my my number fields k that them, that I want to count. And so I want to count. I want to ask this question here: How many number fields are there? Um, and of course, if I don't put anything in that blank, we know the answer is that they're infinitely many. And so what's interesting here is um, uh, what, you, what exactly you want to count to try to understand in the zoo of number fields, in the universe of number fields, what you see when you look out there in it. So one of the um, kind of starting restrictions you might make uh, is putting in this blank something like of degree um, uh, D and say discriminant up to X. I'm going to be talking about the absolute discriminant so much I'm going to write it as DK, the absolute value of the discriminant of K and maybe you want this to be at most X for some large X and then in that case, you are often interested not in the value for some particular x, like x equals a thousand, but how this grows asymptotically. You know, we'll see. All right, so that's a, that. This is a very fine question for which we um, uh, know the answer for only a few uh, d. And as even for the the first few d, as you, you go beyond d equals two you start realizing, well, when you're talking about degree three fields, there are really two kinds of degree three fields. There are the Galois cyclic cubic fields and the non-Galois fields, and they're pretty different. And then when you get to degree four, you see that also that Galois structure matters. So it's often very convenient uh, in this question, and the answers come more naturally, if we fix that Galois structure. Now, what do I mean by a Galois structure? Be in the degree three case, there's the ones that are Galois, and then there are the ones that aren't Galois. And the best way to fix the what I want to think of as Galois structure is looking at the Galois group of the Galois closure. So if I have a number field k over q, I'll write k tilde for its Galois closure, and 
Now that just tells me about the Galois closure, but if I want to know about how K sits inside of its Galois closure, one way to do that is by looking at the action of the Galois group of K tilde over Q uh, as it acts on all of the embeddings, the homomorphisms from K into the Galois closure. And so that makes this a permutation group, not just a group, but a group with an action on a finite set. And so um, when I have a field not necessarily Galois, the sort of Galois structure that I will fix is the Galois closure of its, the, sorry, the Galois group of its Galois closure as a permutation group in this way. And then really the driving question uh, in this area of number field counting uh, is what are the asymptotics of this function? Well, I'll call in G of X, where G should be a permutation group, the number of K over Q, where this Galois group is G, and I mean here as a per permutation group, um, with a discriminant bounded. All right, so the, the um, uh, first, First case of this is when the Galois group is C2, say, acting on two things. Uh, the, um, and this is just counting quadratic fields. All right, so to count quadratic fields, w one, one way to start is what well, we just know all of the quadratic fields, right? When we take algebraic number theory, that's a thing um, we learn. And let's just remember, because it's a little bit relevant as we think about the higher degrees, how do we know all the quadratic fields? How was it that we, we got a list of them? Well, they each had to be, say, generated by some alpha um, and some algebraic number, and we could always take that by clearing denominators to be an algebraic integer. So some alpha that satisfies a polynomial like this, alpha squared plus a alpha plus b equals zero, and we could change by um, uh, subtracting off a, a, an integer or a half integer from alpha and clearing denominators again, we could say that the field was generated by, say, some alpha that satisfied an equation like this. To, you know, after we eliminate the a coefficient, say alpha squared minus d equals zero. So we're joining the square root of d, and then also by clearing or unclearing denominators, we could assume that d is square free. And so this is, this is how we knew that we could find all of the quadratic fields sort of among adjoining the square roots of, of square free integers. Now, and then we, we check maybe, you know, in, in our algebraic number three course, we check that these are different. Um, now, that might seem intuitively obvious, but there is something to check there. How do you know that when you join the square root of three that you don't somehow uh, in that field get a square root of seven? I mean, some things are surprising, perhaps, um, how various primes split uh, when you join the square root of three might not have been a priori obvious, but in any case, for in many different ways, um, you know, such as checking the behavior of different primes, we can see that, that these, in fact, give us all all different fields, and moreover, since I was so interested in counting these fields up to discriminant x, importantly, we can, in each case, uh, compute the discriminant uh, and know what it is and in which case, I mean, as um, Hendrik spoke about earlier, finding the ring of integers in general is a challenging uh, a challenging problem in, if you're in some completely general setup. So just because we know the field doesn't mean we know the ring of integers or the discriminant. But here, of course, uh, everything can be worked out because it's such a small case. Um, and so then roughly uh, now to count these asymptotically, we need to count something like square free integers. In the notes, um, I, I carefully give a version of this argument where you would actually count fundamental discriminants or discriminants of quadratic fields. But then you have to be very fussy at two because these aren't quite square free integers. They sometimes have these factors of two and it depends on other things. Uh, all right, so for simplicity in, um, in this talk, I'm going to count square free integers to sort of convince you in practice that we could count these uh, discriminants of quadratic fields. And then you can, you can refer to the notes for, for, for the real version. So let's let n of x be um, the number of, of square free integers from 1 to x. And 
it, it, one way to think about it is, well, I have all these integers, and then I want to get rid of the ones that have square factors. So I'm going to let n sub n of x to be the integers that have an n squared factor in them. So the d that can be written as n squared times uh, d that are also in this set from 1 to x. All right, and if I want to count square free integers, like I said, I could start with all this n1 of x. That's just all the integers in the interval from 1 to x. So this is actually counting square free positive integers here, I guess I should say. Um, and then I should throw out all of the integers that are divisible by p squared for each prime p. So this here is a sum over, over p prime of n p of x. This gets rid of everything that's divisible by p squared. Except the problem is, if I have something that's divisible by p squared and q squared, I've thrown it out twice. And so I continue in the usual inclusion, exclusion way, and I have to add those back in. Uh, and now I have to correct for the things that are divisible by um, by three factors, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so we write that all together, what the inclusion exclusion does, and that says that the number of square free integers is the sum over n of this Mobius function that is the sign that tells you whether you need to be throwing them in or out or uh, um, uh, times, times this in n sub n. And I'm going to use this then to estimate the count of these square free integers. Okay, so um, now these terms are even only appearing, right, that we have that for n sub n of x to be non-zero, for there to even be a term here, we need that n is less than or equal to the square root of x, or we're not going to have any numbers that are divisible by n squared in this interval from 1 to x. So that says that I can take this sum instead of over all n, I can just take it up to the square root of x. I've got my Mobius function here, my sign, and then this is actually something that's pretty easy to count. This is just integers from 1 to x that are divisible by n squared. So that's roughly x over n squared. And in fact, I really have very good control over how much I could be off by. Right? It's the floor of n over x over n squared, which is, which is at, most, at most one off um, from, from, from x over n squared. All right. So um, now, if I collect together these terms, these x over n squared terms, I put them all together um, uh, with the Mobius coefficients. Now I'm going to sum over all n, because this sum is much nicer over all n. Uh, uh, so I have to subtract off the terms from n that are greater than x squared, uh, which I do here. And then these O of 1s, this error term that could have been as big as 1, I got that for each of square root of x terms. So I have some square root of x error here coming from these O of 1s. And now um, this summing over all in the x pulls out. It has nothing to do with the sum. And this sum of mu of n over n squared has, this, has the beautiful factorization of the product over primes of 1 minus p to the minus 2. Um, and then this error goes into here. But also this, if you look at this sum, again, the x would pull out. And whatever these signs are, you could bound them by the absolute value. And this is you know, uh, the sum of 1 over n squared starting at the square root of x. So use the integral comparison uh, and get that that is, again, this big O of x over the square root of x. And that just goes into the same error term. All right, so I have then um, uh, this. This is a, just a number. It's a particular number. Uh, it's uh, zeta two, zeta two inverse, right? So um, 
but it, it doesn't particularly matter. That's just the sort of convenient way uh, to write that number times x. And I wrote here little o of x because, frankly, a lot of the time we're not going to get nearly as good of error terms as this uh, square root of x. Though here, here we happen to do to do much better. When I ask what are the asymptotics of, you know, the number of quadratic fields of discriminant x, this is the sort of first kind of thing that would be an answer. What I mean by an asymptotic count is that you have some main term and you know that the, the difference between the actual value and the main term is little o of the main term, meaning you know when you divide by the main term in the limit, it goes t to zero. So this is, um, this is the asymptotics. And so, of course, I was just counting square free positive integers here. Um, uh, in the notes, this same argument, uh, now it has more funky numbers uh, in it, but it counts quadratic fields and gives you actually the same answer. So there's all these funny things happening at two, and they all somehow miraculously cancel each other out, and you get the, you get the same answer. Um, you, and you also have negative discriminants and positive discriminants and all the funny stuff at two, and it, and it, and it works out. Um, Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, thank you. I don't need the inverse because I put it in the denominator. I'm just so used to writing zeta two inverse. It just like I never write zeta two. Like that doesn't that number doesn't come up in my life. So, <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, all right. Are there any questions about that? Yes. Ah, yes, you should multiply by two when you need to take into account the negative discriminants. But then you need to do all sorts of other things at two because you have, you know, these discriminants like eight and, uh, right, and, and 12 that aren't square free because they have these factors of two. And so you have to also multiply by a bunch of other factors to accommodate that and then they all cancel out. You can see that in the notes that it, it works out. Uh, yes, you would think, shouldn't it be twice as much? But then there's this phenomena that we, we push off and make some of the discriminants bigger by multiplying them by four, and that, that all magically, magically cancels. Good question. Good question? All right. Okay, great, done with quadratic fields. So let's go to higher degree. All right, we can start the same way. Um, uh, we can say, okay, look, a cubic field, it's gotta be generated by some algebraic number, satisfy some polynomial. Again, I can you know, clear denominators and I can get rid of the, the, the alpha squared term. So now I'm just basically looking at say, you know, P, Q integers here that parameterize some polynomials that algebraic numbers of degree three could satisfy. Um, but now I have some questions that become much harder than the quadratic case. When did, if I have, you know, give you two P pairs of PQ, when do a PQ and a P prime Q prime give the same field? Um, I mean, among other things, it, we know for, for um, Cubic fields, the discriminants no longer discriminate the fields. There are, can be fields with a, the same discriminant. And, and, and how can we, is there any easy way to see, I mean, and the real answer is that there's not any easy way to generally see for this kind of counting um, uh, when 2P and Q give the same field. And then we also then need to know, even if we have a P and Q that give us some field, what is the discriminant of that field? Um, so we can have compute the discriminant of the polynomial quite easily and we know that the discriminant of the field divides the discriminant of the polynomial and it's just off by some square factors. But getting those, you know, getting those right um, is not something that one can just easily write down for all cubic fields all at once like we did in the quadratic case. These become much, uh, much thornier questions. Um, so, you, of course, in any individual case, you can answer, you know, maybe the numbers are too large or something, you can answer these, uh, these questions, but in nothing like the systematic way, we answer it for all quadratic fields and we, where we can just say, look, here's a list, these are all the quadratic fields. Um, so, and not systematically enough, 
to count, um, maybe I, uh, <laughs> to count, let me, uh, let me add a word here, to count easily. All right, okay. Okay, so the moral, just my point here is that you know, often when uh, people are new to number field counting, the first question is, but you know, number fields basically just correspond to polynomials. So aren't they, isn't it just about polynomials? And um, the isomorphism classes of number fields are not the same thing as polynomials because in particular, it's hard, I mean, for these two reasons, it's hard to, to know systematically when two polynomials will give the same field um, and it's hard to know what the discriminant of the field is given just the polynomial um, and we'll see more and, and one sees more in the example of the notes that, that this actually makes some of the asymptotic and the statistical and the counting phenomena quite different if you say take a random number field from looking at all number fields up to discriminant x versus if you take a random polynomial and you see what number field you, you, you get. It's a, it's a different kind of thing. Um, Nonetheless, uh, even though uh, there is is this gap between between sort of pinning down number fields and just writing down polynomials, in general, um, uh, that among among other things, so actually looking for algebraic numbers via this general direction of approach still gives us the best general approach to say finding what the degree d fields are but um, not in some way that you can can write down a simple formula but just in terms of computation doing a tabulation of fields by which I mean making tables listing each field of bounded discriminant um, at most x once and so in um, you know in arbitrary degree that's that's uh, the best way that we have to, to, to start finding fields and in fact um, um, with enough with heuristics that account for these two features how much overcounting you're getting from counting the same field from multiple algebraic integers and how much your discriminants are off so for with accounting for those two things and some some heuristics there's a beautiful paper of uh, Rule Shankar and Jacob Zimmerman where they give a conjecture for the number of um, the asymptotic count of SD number fields so degree D number fields whose Galois closure is group uh, Galois group SD and they actually are able to unconditionally prove enough of the heuristics to use this to count non-Galois cubic fields asymptotically. I'm going to talk a little bit about an older approach to doing that that's a little simpler um, uh, but even though their their approach is more more complicated than what we're going to talk about it it, it, it does, it is exciting because it says that, you know, with enough work, there is something you can do, at least in one case, to overcome um, these, these two challenges of the sort of overcounting and the lack of control of, of, of the discriminant um, and actually asymptotically count fields. Um, so, okay. And still this sort of approach of looking for algebraic numbers instead of fields also gives us what the in cases where we can't count fields asymptotically gives us the best currently known upper and lower bounds um, on those on those numbers um, but I should say these were all I was saying these are these asymptotics for SD fields by which I mean degree D fields whose Galois group uh, of the Galois closure is SD so as big as possible but in general, this approach gives much less access to understanding um, G extensions when G isn't this full Gawa group um, of SD because um, we know from Hilbert's irreducibility theorem that a generic degree D polynomial uh, in an appropriate sense but also a sense that can uh, be made quantitative 
uh, is it has Galois group full SD and so if you th th another problem with this approach is if you're interested in G extensions that aren't quite so generic then you may be looking a long time at algebraic numbers before you find one before you find one that generates uh, the G that you want so I think I don't know if anyone is in here I know there's a group this week like trying to find uh, a uh, field with a particular Galois group so they have a sense of how, how hard that is all right, so um, however, there are some different approaches uh, beyond uh, just looking for algebraic numbers of the appropriate degree that can be used to count asymptotically number fields of with this uh, Galois structure given by G um, that have I mean, these are these are three approaches that have yielded many results. There are some there are other approaches uh, as well. But as a brief taste, I am going to you know very quickly give you a sample of what you know three three different other ways besides looking for algebraic integers are um, to count to count number fields. All right, and so the first approach. Um, the first approach is to use class field theory. And this, of course, applies uh, quite well when G is abelian. Uh, <laughs> uh, and because in that case, class field theory tells us about um, the uh, the abelian extensions of a number field. Now, I set up for simplicity this talk over Q, where everything were extensions of Q. But of course, it's not hard to imagine, that, and one does ask these questions over a general number field uh, or even a, uh, function fields. And um, so even though over Q, one can work with class field theory quite explicitly um, using the cyclotomic fields, I'm going to do it in a more general way, which may feel like overkill if you're just working over Q, but the reason that I'm going to do this is that it works very well over general uh, global fields. And so it's, so, so this is meant to be um, a taste of, of, of the a method that can do much more than what we're gonna we're gonna see today, and what we're gonna see today is the count of cyclic cubic fields. So where the Galois group is the cyclic group uh, on of order three acting on three elements, and this counting was done um, uh, via this kind of approach by um, by Cohn many years ago. So what does class field theory tell us? It tells us that these C3 extensions, and another way to talk about C3 extensions is to think of them in terms of homomorphisms from the Galois group of Q bar over Q, the absolute Galois group to C3. Now these aren't quite C3 extensions because you know there's the trivial homomorphism and the, you, there are two homomorphisms that correspond to each field, but okay, these are roughly the, the, these C3 fields and they correspond to homomorphisms from the Adele class group of Q uh, to the cyclic group of order three. And uh, this is is gone through in the notes in a little more detail. But for this for this purpose, the um, the Adele class group it's isomorphic to the product over P of uh, of Z P star times the positive reals, um, and so the. The homomorphisms from this absolute Galois group to C3 or the C3 fields are simply given by homomorphisms of this into C3. Conti everything needs to be continuous homomorphisms, and there's a restricted, pr some restricted products here, um, which means that only in these homomorphisms, only finitely many of the homomorphisms can be uh, non-trivial, and so our s the positive reals don't have any continuous homomorphisms to, to C3 since it's it's discrete. And so this says to pick a cyclic cubic field, I need to pick at each p a homomorphism from z p star to c three. All right, so that is a way in which class field theory makes very concrete kind of what are all um, what are all the fields in a way that's very good for counting. Now it's not necessarily. Uh, giving you 
a, you know, giving you those, po those polynomials, those algebraic integers, so it's quite different. It's not, uh, that, that takes a lot more, more work, but it's very good at just saying, like, here, you can understand the set of the C3 fields. All right, because homomorphisms from ZP star into C3 aren't so complicated. I'm going to ignore P equals 3. Um, uh, though again, I think that is done carefully in the notes. And so say if P is not 3, then um, ZP star, so the, 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 the p-adic units, they have a map to Z mod um, uh, PZ star, and the kernel here is a pro P group. So if I'm looking for a map to C3, it's not going to care at all. It's not going to see any of this kernel. It's just going to factor through um, Z mod PZ star. And we know very well what Z mod PZ star is. It's isomorphic as a group to Z mod P minus 1 Z. So I have a cyclic group of order P minus 1, and I want to know about its group homomorphisms into C3. All right, so when P is 1 mod 3, I get two non-trivial maps, exactly. And uh, when P is 2 mod 3, I don't get any non-trivial maps. And of course, I always have the trivial map. So, um, so understanding what these homomorphisms are from the absolute Gaul group to C3 simply is saying, OK, ignore 3, <laughs> um, a sweeping 3 under the rug. Otherwise, is at each prime is 1 mod 3, I um, get to choose, do I want a trivial map, or do I want one of the non-trivial maps, or do I want the other non-trivial map? Also, um, another useful feature of the, the homomorphism of class field theory is that it tells us, in terms of this data, what is the discriminant of the corresponding field. And we're just going to say the field was unramified at, 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 at 3. Say we took the trivial map at, at 3. Uh, though, the, like, again, in the notes, the full case with 3 has worked out. Um, and here, the discriminant is simply the product over the p's where we chose a non-trivial map all squared. All right, so these are these zp's are the um, are the inertia groups in uh, in this Galois group, and so a prime is ramified if and only if the zp maps non-trivially to the to c3, and you know away from three you. Um, uh, know that in the case of a cubic, a cyclic cubic field, um, a, a ramified prime will divide the discriminant exactly twice. And so, not only do we have a sort of easy way to see in data like what are all the C3 fields, but we have an easy formula for their discriminants. And so, we're now um, to uh, we're now to a question that's quite quite similar to the question we had before with quadratic fields, where we wanted to count square-free uh, integers. We now want to count these integers, well, you know, up to the fact that they're all squared. We're roughly, we want to count square-free integers um, that are only products of primes that are 1 mod 3, but since we have these two choices at each of the ramified primes, we need to put in factors for that. And that is, is um, gets sufficiently complicated that it's worth introducing a more general tool to count these things. And also, this general tool will allow, uh, allow us to count abelian G extensions for any G. Okay, so we're going to bring in a tool from analytic number theory that says, if I build a Dirichlet series, so I've got some A sub N coefficients on N to the minus S, and I think about it as a function in a complex variable S. The asymptotics of the, um, oops, there's a term here that shouldn't be here. Um, the asymptotics of a sub n up to x, so the asymptotics of the, the, the partial sums of the coefficients up to x can be understood in terms of the rightmost poles of this function. So that's a really 
beautiful and important thing when you want to count something. Um, if, when you put the, the things you want to count as coefficients on the Dirichlet series, you can say something about the analytic behavior of that function. Now, I think we know from many things in number theory, just because you put some coefficients on a Dirichlet series doesn't mean that you understand the analytic um, uh, behavior, but, but when you do, it's, it's, it's very useful. So in this case, what does this look like? So this Dirichlet series, where we put the things that we want to count as the coefficients here, um, like how many, how many of our homomorphisms to C3 above had, you know, discriminant in. So what does that look like? It looks like the product over primes that are 1 mod 3 times 1 plus 2 times P to the minus 2S. Right, because at each p that we were going to pick, um, that we want to let ramify, we had sort of two choices for that that map. And if we choose one of those two non-trivial choices, then p is going to contribute to the discriminant, and otherwise it won't. So this is the Dirichlet series of things that we were wanting to count above. Um, and indeed, this is a Dirichlet series whose analytic behavior. Um, now we can understand something about at least up to its its rightmost pole. Um, okay, so I'm uh, here. So I'm going to continue to ignore everything happening at p equals three. It doesn't really change. It's just one factor. It's not going to change any big analytic results. So the way that we can under oops, I didn't mean to erase. The way that we can understand the asymptotic behavior of this Dirichlet series is by comparing it to some other functions that we know, uh, sorry, the analytic behavior of this Dirichlet series, we can compare it to some other functions that we know um, the analytic behavior of. And given this form, it's natural to look at the, the following product of functions. So the zeta function, I'm going to evaluate it at 2s, because we see this is all kind of happening in 2s, times the Dirichlet L function for the Dirichlet character mod 3, again evaluated um, at 2s. And so each of these functions can be written with an Euler product. And at p that are 1 mod 3, um, they each have a 1 minus p to the minus 2s to the minus 1 factor. So you collect that same factor when p is 1 mod 3. Now, when p is 2 mod 3, from the L function, the Dirichlet character, you get one of these minuses becomes a plus, and those two things multiply to 1 minus p to the minus 4s. So, um, now when you first look at this, uh, the, oops, I mean, except that they're both Euler products, you might say, okay, that looks like quite different than this. This doesn't have any p equals 2 terms, and the terms are all different. Um, but in these Euler factors, it's the sort of leading, the leading terms that contribute uh, to, the, to the asymptotics. And this, because this is a minus and there's a minus 2 here, actually has this same leading term, a 2p to the minus 2s, if you were to sort of write out the, the geometric series that you get from taking this to the minus 1 or to the minus 2. Um, okay, and so let me just say how that happens. So if we look at the ratio of the Dirichlet series of the things that we want to count to the product of these functions that we know very well, the Raymond Zeta function and this Dirichlet L function, what we get, and you know, okay, up to my arithmetic being poor for, for calculating these integers, <laughs> we get an Euler product where the leading term um, terms are at p to the minus 4s. And so when you just think about when you, when you multiply this out and what you get and what it looks like, this, um, this converges for the real part of s greater than a fourth. So this is analytic. This ratio is analytic for the real part of s greater than a fourth. So that says that in terms of looking for poles, um, that, that this Dirichlet series of the things that we want to count and this Dirichlet series that we know have the same poles up to real part of S as a fourth. Um, so uh, that means that this Dirichlet series has its rightmost pole at S equals one half um, like this function, which we very well know has a pole at S equals one half uh, from 
uh, the zeta function evaluated at 2s there. Uh, so, so the comparison uh, between the Euler products for the thing that we want to count, which we got kind of a pretty uh, Dirichlet series from, from class field theory, and some uh, functions that we know and we know about their, their poles, uh, let us uh, use, use this. And it, it tells us that the asymptotics of um, uh, the number of cyclic cubic fields up to discriminant x is like a constant times x to the one half uh, plus some term that uh, asymptotically is smaller. Oops, I should. <laughs> That's not a very useful result, what I wrote right there. Um, <laughs> we need to put a one half in here, <laughs> a term that grows smaller than, than x to the one half. All right, um, and so let me just say, right, so this, this one half here, and I so in the notes I have a uh, Tiberian theorem that, that you can apply and uh, see in general how you use this rightmost pole to get an asymptotic count, but just the sort of basic thing is that this one half becomes this one half, right? And this constant here comes from the residue um, uh, at that pole, and actually, you can compute that residue at the pole very explicitly because you know the residue of this function. And then this, uh, you can just evaluate it at, at 1 to see how it changes the residue. So you can actually compute, oops, you can compute that C, um, C very explicitly from this. Um, and indeed, with a lot more work keeping track of all the things there are to keep track of, uh, this general approach uh, can be used uh, to count all abelian fields, meaning for each abelian G to count the asymptotics of G extensions. So this was first done by um, uh, Maki and uh, many others have, have, have worked on this problem and used this approach uh, referenced in the notes like Wright and uh, Frey, Longren, and Newton. Um, and so you can, and the, the general strategy has, has come, uh, come a long way, but the rough outline of, okay, class field theory tells us the set of these things. We can put the things as coefficients on a Dirichlet series. Uh, we can use then analytic techniques um, to count the things uh, still, still continues. Um, and I'll just say that um, even though uh, class field theory does not um, over general base fields, uh, say, give, um, easily give the explicit polynomials in some systematic way that you can just write down a formula for, it is, it, it is reasonable as a strategy um, uh, for, for tabulation. So certainly much better you don't, if you want to be looking for, say, for some, you know, degree 12 uh, abelian group, the fields with that Galois group, you don't want to just start looking at degree 12 polynomials, you want uh, to, to, use, to use class field theory. So, any questions about that? Yes? It works, yes. So the reason that I presented it this way is because it actually works um, over, over general um, f general global fields, number fields or function fields. Now, you know, a few things are a little different. This is not quite the Adele class group, but it's off by class group and it's off by units and you can write those down and, and there, you know, there are more complications, but this general strategy um, works over, over an arbitrary global field. I don't know if anyone has actually done it when the characteristic of the global field is the same, divides the order of the group, but certainly over any number field this um, this strategy has been been applied so good question yeah and so that's kind of why I presented it this way it's not maybe the most concrete thing you could do for c3 over q but it presents a strategy that works you know for for all b and g over all number fields with with significantly more work <laughs> certainly it um, Okay, 
So, um, all right. Um, the the next um, approach I want to talk about uh, is from. Um, parameterizations and geometry of numbers. And I realized I'm supposed to have a piece of paper up here with me. So I should pull it out here. Okay. All right. So um, another, another way to think about, okay, what could these number fields be? And we, you know, we say we're counting number fields, but then we, when we take the discriminant, of course, the discriminant really belongs to the ring of integers, <laughs> not to the number field. Uh, and, and because there's only one maximal ring of integers, we kind of say, you know, but it's really about the ring of integers. So maybe we should think about, you know, what are these maximal orders of, um, of cubic fields. So I'm going to um, present a strategy that was used, for example, by Davenport and Heilbronn to count uh, cubic fields. Uh, so it's going to turn out that there are more non-Gawa cubic fields, so we could also sort of say to, to count non-Gawa cubic fields. So, but any cubic field, it has some maximal order, and we know that uh, that maximal order as a Z module is just um, is just isomorphic to, to Z cubed, and so we can write down a basis with three elements, and you can, I think it's an exercise in the sheet, so you can pick one of your elements to be one, and so now if I have a Z module um, basis with three elements of a of a of a z algebra that is is free of rank three as a z module what do i need to know the ring that i've got what do i need to know i know how to add everything in terms of you know i have uh, uh, the this z module i need to know how to multiply things and what do i need to know how to multiply i need i already know how to multiply one by everything so i need to know how to multiply um omega by theta and how to square omega and how to square theta. And if I know how to do those three things, if I can fill in uh, numbers, integers here that tell me for each of these multiplications what these things are in terms of the Z module basis, one omega theta, I will know the ring. Right? I know how to do everything. Now I can add, multiply, use the distributive property um, and find the ring. So I can say, okay, well, um, uh, you know, you could you could sort of start by saying, all right, so there's just some sort of numbers here, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, et cetera. All right, but now I, I want to simplify this a little bit, and this is a little bit like the step in the quadratic fields where we cleared the, the linear term and the uh, polynomial. I want to clear some terms. So actually, I can um, modify omega and theta by some integers. I could replace omega with, say, omega plus k for s some integer k, and I could replace theta with theta plus l for, say, some integers k and l, such that I can assume that these two numbers are zero. All right? Because I just say omega theta gave me some number of omegas, and then I subtract that off of theta. So you can you can check that in the exercises that I, by changing omega and theta by a, an integer. In fact, there are unique integers such that I can do this. That's gonna, that's that's important. Such that I can assume that these two coefficients are zero. And now I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven coefficients um, uh, to write down. And if um, if I I write them down here, I'll try to get the right letters. Oh no, I already used L. Okay, um, uh, this R here. Okay, so let's say I write them down. I'm just using letters. So these things are all just going to be some integers. Um, all right, so A, B, etc. These are all integers. Now. Um, so now every cubic field has some ring of integers and I have captured that ring of integers and its isomorphism type in these seven integers. Um, but now I could wonder like, well, how often do these seven integers actually come from a ring of integers in a cubic field? And one of the, the first things that you might want to check actually is that this um, multiplication that you have defined is associative. 
because uh, nothing, uh, nothing about this, this multiplication table forced it to be associative, and certainly the multiplication in uh, OK is associative. So it turns out um, that uh, if you write down the equations of associativity, so the equations of associativity beautifully exactly tell you that these three values have to be certain things up to some sign which no matter how many times I do it I seem to always get wrong but I really hope these are the right signs um, okay this way minus a d um, and minus a c and minus b d so that's a sort of miracle that didn't wasn't a priori anything like this was going to happen. Um, uh, and it tells us that, in fact, there are really only four parameters here. Um, there are four, four parameters, A, B, C, and D, and then associativity forces, um, uh, forces all of these values. And so that's a lot better than, um, that is a lot better than uh, that seven parameters. And now you could start this, say, over a quartic, for a quartic field, or a quintic field, or any degree field. And you could always formally sort of write down parameters, and then you could look at the equations of associativity. And unfortunately, for every degree higher than three, you just get a bunch of equations. <laughs> you don't get this beautiful elimination of variables. Um, and so, so, it's really that coincidence here that we get s s such a clear elimination of variables. And in fact, it's, it's, it's um, maybe I should make this, make this a if and only if. if, when you put the coefficients like this with A, B, C, D, and these are as, as specified, that this does always define an associative algebra. So you get the associativity exactly eliminates um, three of, of your seven variables with no remaining equations. Um, and so, that tells us that the rings of integers of cubic fields, along with, we had to choose a z-basis, a, a z-basis of, but not a z-basis of OK, because we picked one, we, we, there was no choice there. And this omega and theta, we had some unique shift of each of them by an element of z to make these two numbers here zero. So it turns out that that's equivalent to choosing a z-basis of OK mod z. All right, so uh, okay, the ring of integers with a z basis that tur that data turns out to exactly correspond to some tuple of integers a, b, c, d, in 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 z to the fourth. Um, all right, and so if we care just about these OKs. We don't want a choice of basis. We want to forget the choice of basis. So a different basis of OK mod Z um, means that we've, we've, we've changed this by some element of GL2Z, since all bases of Z squared are related by an element of GL2Z. So that means that there must be some GL2Z action on these tuples of four integers, uh, such that, um, you know, s such that, the um, such that that the orbits correspond to the different choices of basis, and so it turns out that you can work out explicitly um, what the action is on z to the fourth. So that's done in the notes and in exercises, and also which a b c d in z to the fourth actually correspond to okay for some cubic number field k. Uh, and that is not done explicitly in the notes, but many references are given and it's sort of talked about. It's mainly sort of local conditions at, at every prime um, and one sort of global condition. But the key to all of these conditions is that, in some sense, generic tuples of four integers, A, B, C, D, actually correspond to OK. So it's not like we're hunting for needles in a haystack. It's most of these A, B, C, Ds actually came from the things that we want to count, and they're just some of them, some of them we need to throw out. Uh, and so that is, that is, is helpful. Mm. Uh, and what it, what allows uh, what allows counting, um, and how that counting goes uh, is that 
um, I said there's, you know, a GL2Z action, so we only want to count one element in each GL2Z orbit over here so to count each OK once. And that comes from counting um, A, B, C, D in a fundamental domain for that action. So there's some fundamental domain. I do this picture not only because it's probably all of your favorite fundamental domains, but literally, like, you can use some image of this fundamental domain to find the fundamental domain for this problem. Maybe not a big surprise because SL2 and GL2 are, are similar. Uh, oops. Uh, and so then you have some problem where you have a fundamental domain, some, some region, and you want to count lattice points in that region. And um, the techniques from geometry of numbers can be used. There's some difficulty. The regions have some cusps uh, that are very thin, and you have to make some arguments. So th there's, there's more to do. But I wanted to sort of outline the, the general strategy, which is once you, you reduce it to a problem of counting lattice points in, in a region. Um, Okay, uh, and so not only does this give the count. Oh, I think I didn't. I think I didn't write it down. I wrote it, um, write it, write it in the in the in the notes. But this gives the count, um, the asymptotic count of non-Gala S3 cubic fields, which um, is actually this. Um, not only does it give give the count, um, this general strategy of then looking for these appropriate lattice points in a fundamental domain gives very fast tabulation of cubic fields. Um, and Kareem Bailboss actually has some software that is still available online and still super useful if you want to find yourself some cubic fields um, uh, by by finding them in this way, um, and I just want to mention I talk about this more in the notes, but I th this so this strategy of parameterization and geometry of numbers has been used by Bargava to count. Um, quartic and quintic uh, SD extensions and uh, that in the way that this strategy led to fast tabulation of cubic fields I think has some potential to lead uh, to fast tabulation of quartic and quintic fields. So I think there are some really interesting directions there. All right. Um, so, all right, I am uh, about at the end of my talk and will tell you about um, uh, quickly about the final uh, strategy, um, which is one also sometimes can count extensions by counting extensions of extensions. So, for example, D4 quartic extensions. Um, so this means quartic number fields whose Gala group is D4. And so this is, say, my quartic number field and the Gala group is D4, and I made the Gala diagram over here. I've got D4, which is, say, the subgroup of, of automorphisms of a, of a square. And then um, uh, I've got uh, K, the quartic field, corresponds to 2, 4. And then inside of here, there's another uh, subgroup here, which corresponds to some quadratic, subquadratic field. So a D4 field is a quadratic extension of a quadratic extension. And so if we're very good at counting quadratic extensions, and I said for abelian extensions we can count them over a general base field, then if I can count extensions and I can count extensions of extensions, um, I should be able to put that, put that together. So over a general base, this say is the counting function of counting fields, and if I count quadratic extensions of quadratic extensions, they don't have to be D4 fields, but the other possibilities are abelian, and like I said, we can already count all the abelian things. And so I could say, well, I'm going to count something like D4 fields by summing over all quadratic extensions, and now I'm going to count their quadratic extensions up to this discriminant. And, uh, you know, the discriminant of a composite field, you have a formula for that, so you put that in to see what you need to put, it, put in here. Um, and let's say we could do that. For each, for each quadratic field, we can count its, uh, its quadratic extensions with a similar formula. Uh, the problem is that this is an infinite sum and that doesn't behave well with this little o of x or this limit like for any finitely many quadratic fields fine but if I have infinitely many quadratic fields these error terms it's they could possibly swamp out the main term um, and so you need some additional information some kind of bound on how big these counts can be um, absolutely uh, and not just with like a little o or a limit and so this is for example the kind of, of, of tail bound that you could use and uh, when when you have a bound like that, you can then um, 
uh, you can then sort of use this, <laughs> use this to um, so just sort of interchange, not the sum and the little o, because you don't always write the little o, you know, to interchange with the sum. Um, and that, again, is done, done uh, carefully in uh, the notes uh, and is another, you know, another strategy that uh, for many Galois groups sort of allows us to, to count extensions of extensions. You have to have, as you see in something like this tailbound, a little more information than just an asymptotic count of extensions at each layer. Um, but if you do have that, uh, you can sometimes uh, put, them, put them together. All right, uh, so that is it for today. Do we have any quick questions before lunch? All right, let's thank Melanie again.